this session is going to be a little bit longer, probably closer to 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, we're going to be building on basically API. So we're going to be having information from the outside world come into our creator application. And we're going to be sending information from our creator application to the outside world to get some pieces of information back from it. We'll start at the basics. I got some fluff content, and then we'll just go into the product. This is just the filler content to kind of get people excited about integrations. But uh, so you have a bunch of different applications. And when you have applications inside each one, or basically different things inside each one, your value starts getting what we call commoditized, where basically something at the lowest level becomes so cheap or some indifferentiable that there's no real value of one or the other, right? So you start moving from hardware, operating systems, uh, your application infrastructure, and then inside. So you have like your actual physical computers, your tablets, and stuff like that. Um, your, your databases or your backend things that are hosting the application, and then the actual applications themselves. Um, so before people were making end user web apps, obviously the things below that made you know, more sense and were more valuable to you and you had to pay more attention to them. But now you're kind of just only buying the thing at the very top of the level, top level, because that's what you actually get value out of, right? So that's the most important part. So within the application layer, it gets a little bit more complicated because there's different apps built to do different things. And so you have your productivity and collaboration apps which is like email, instant messaging, um, online office stuff, and all those things. If someone told you you had to pay $50 a month for like Google Docs, you'd probably not want to pay it, right? Because even though it's a super valuable tool, you know that it's not really worth maybe more than five, seven bucks a month, give or take. Um, and so that's why you start, that's why different apps have different pricing models, but until it becomes commoditized and there's so many different options out there, or even that it becomes so, I guess, regular, you don't want to pay for it anymore. Kind of like how AIM is free, or used to be free, I guess. Um, most chat applications are free. They don't charge you on a per message basis or per contact basis, right? And so once that value starts getting moving or starts moving up the chain um, in the CRM space, marketing, all these different business apps, we basically get to the value of integration. So integrations is kind of what separates one product from another when you're using multiple vendors for different pieces of things. And so the best equation usually to use is the fact that if you're using two different products, one plus one, if they're actually integrated together, it equals three because the sum of the two inputs that you put together, having that visual, I guess, connection between both products makes them a lot more valuable. That's kind of like the whole Zoho thing we're going for is integrations across products. Coming from a single vendor, you're not having to do a bunch of patchwork to send information from one service to another. Um, and so two main types of um, ways that two different applications are going to communicate with each other. The first one is information coming in. So this is a screenshot from my phone from like last night. Um, and I opened up the Hyatt app. And in the Hyatt app, I can look at you know, my stays. And if I click on the location, it will show me the location of the hotel that I'm currently at. Um, but if I was at the airport, I could click on location. And it will show me where I am relative to where the, um, where the hotel is. And at the very bottom of this small little red box, there's an option for rides by Uber, right? And so if I click on that uh, little icon down there, the next or the third screen comes up, and that's basically where it'll automatically tell my current location from my phone, the, the drop-off location, which is the hotel's address, and then it also estimates out how far away different cars are, tar, car types are going to be and the estimated prices for it, right? And so the way that that's happening is the outside information that Uber has about um, what do you call it? pricing estimates based on the trip fare is going to come into um, what do you call it? come into the Hyatt app where you can book a Uber directly, right? And for Hyatt, it's, it's good because people can book rides very easily. For Uber, it's even better because now people have a different way to book rides and it kind of just gives them another avenue to be reminded that you can get a ride by Uber. Um, and so it works and it's kind of convenient for both parties um, to have this kind of an integration going for them. The other option is information going out. And so sometimes you have application or information in one application and it needs to go out to another one, right? So the best example of this is everyone's Facebook stuff went to Cambridge Analytica, right? You thought you were putting it in one place, it went out, you had no control over it. That's information going out. That time without consent, but most of the time when you do these kind of integrations, you're going to have some level of consent. So that's really the only information going out example that I have because it's the most relevant, I guess. Um, so when these two products are talking to each other, whether it's the Hyatt app or whether it's Cambridge Analytica tapping into your Facebook information, um, they're all communicating via APIs. And these APIs can be private or public, depending on the company's business model. Um, Facebook obviously makes a lot of money selling data information about your data, so they make money off their APIs. Um, Uber, on the other hand, they're not going to charge you to, make, to have the ability to book Ubers from another application because they're just getting more business that way. So their APIs are a lot more lax, and it just depends on the different you know, business models that those different services have. So here's your de facto stock image of things plugging in and integrating, and it looks kind of cool. So it must be an important slide. And we're going to keep going. 
And so we're going to make some custom integrations via API. And there's four main concepts that I want to cover before we just jump into the product and start doing some stuff. Um, authentication. So if you've ever seen the matrix, everybody know who this guy is? The key maker. The key maker has all the keys to everything. You can open every door in the matrix. It's magic. There's no reason or there's no, ex I don't think there was a good explanation of why you could do it, but it was like an anomaly or something like that. But beyond the point, this one guy had access to everything based on different unique keys. And the same way you have different authentication types for how you can get in and out of certain private sectors of information and different services. So similarly in creator apps, you have your um, sharing permissions that we set up in the last session that kind of enables someone to see and access only certain bits of information. But when it's two different products remotely talking to each other, you got to make sure we verify that the right person is only seeing the right details and not other people's information that's not relevant to them. So there's a couple different types of authentication that happens. The most common ones that we see every day is what's called basic, right? Basic means you go to a website, that website prompts you to enter a username and password, you click submit, it, uh, what do you call it? It verifies that your username and password is okay, and then it'll go and deliver new content to you based on that username and password that you had set. It'll have all your preferences, it'll have whatever items you've saved in there, all that kind of stuff, right? So basic authentication is kind of like your customer portal login for relatable terms. Another option is something called keys. And so keys are probably, it's definitely the most common I would say, but um, it's kind of being moved into the next one. But keys are super simple because instead of having to type in your username and password, that's okay if you're manually doing it. But if you're programmatically trying to access information from somewhere else and every time it's gonna to wanna to know who is the person accessing that information, you don't wanna to have to type in your username and password. And more importantly, you don't want your username and password to be exposed in the process of connecting to a product. So what these guys came up with was, we'll take your username, we'll pick, take your password, and we'll assign you this long character string, uh, capitals, lower cases, hyphens, numbers, doesn't really matter. Every product does it a little bit differently. And you can use this key, and this key is basically like your, like what the key maker has basically, where you can access information based on that, uh, based on the information that's tied to that API key, which is really end up just really being tied back to your username and password. Um, so it's just an easy way, instead of having to expose your email and, and password in like plain text anywhere, it's kind of, it doesn't masking, but essentially they have the same purpose. You send over the key, it verifies that key, and then it'll deliver back information based on that. Next option, a little bit more complicated graph, don't really worry about how this kind of works, but this is kind of what we're used to when uh, apps have something that says like login with Facebook or login with Google. Basically you click that login with Google button, it's gonna open up a new tab or redirect you on your browser, you type in your Google credentials, it'll tell you all the stuff that this new service wants to see about your Google profile, maybe they wanna see your name, your email, your birthday, maybe they wanna see your emails, maybe they want access to your contacts, they almost always want access to your contacts. Um, and so all the times that those two things are being connected, it'll verify what information you want to share, you click OK, and it'll redirect you right back to the original application, and now you're authenticated. You never had to type in your username, or you never had to make a new account on the site. Next thing we got is limits, right? So basically, for every time you're accessing information from some service, there's going to be two main types of limits. One is going to be how many times per day, generally, and the other one is going to be, uh, what do you call, how often something can be requested, right? And so the reason these two look kind of similar, but it's more so to kind of pace out the amount of requests that are coming so you're not overloaded with them too much, right? And so normally I do this whole spiel where I ask somebody in the front row a bunch of questions and they're not able to answer fast enough, but it's a long day and I feel like they're not gonna be able to answer fast enough anyway. Um, so I'll just kind of let that example kind of slide by. But the second column on the right-hand side tells you you can't do more than 25 requests per second. So if you're trying to request a bunch of information about a bunch of different things all in one single, you know, batch request, it might time out because it has to go and, you know, the service that you're requesting information from has to take that request in, it has to figure out what it is that you're looking for, it has to go fetch it from some other, you know, however they're storing it in their own database, it has to come back and return it and then send it back to you. And it's basically saying that we can't do that more than 25 times per second on your specific account. Uh, this is something that generally, the how often, is generally something you can't really mess with. Most people will not let you pay more for requests per second, just because that's like a rate limiting thing. Um, just so they make sure that services don't crash because too many people are accessing the service. The second one on the left hand side, generally you can usually pay for more of, right? So if you're making actual different integration actions between connecting, let's say, your third party accounting software with your creator application, how many times can you request information per day? The general reason they limit this 
or anybody really limits this as one because if they allow too many requests per day, then they're going to get overloaded and they might not have the bandwidth or the networking resources or even the infrastructure to be able to handle all those requests. And two, it's an easy way to make money off of people too, right? Because if you know that they're going to need access to this information, then they'll probably pay for it. A good example of how many times per day you can use something is, um, let's say, a Google Maps API. If you want to be able to map things or figure out how far your customers are. You have an address information in your creator application and you want to see how far they are from your home base and how many minutes it's going to take to deliver you know, whatever product you're delivering. You can go and ping Google, figure out the start and end point, get the information from Google back and find out you know, how far it is and what the, what do you call it, the estimated time is and you send it back to creator so you can see it but you can only do that a certain amount of times per day and once you hit that limit they're basically like hold up, well you're using this way more than like a quote normal person would so instead we're going to start charging you for it and so um, you know that's how a lot of people make money again back in the API side of things so money dollar signs great next thing anybody know what bop it is there's this is a little game that people have I guess had maybe more so um, and basically it'll be a little speaker in there and it'll say like bop it and then it'll say hey, pull it and then you like have to pull it and if generally you might try to spin it instead of pulling it it'll make this big crashing sound and you lost the game. So you kind of see how far you can go along with it. But essentially they're just different methods of doing an interaction with the system um, to kind of get a higher score. How is that related, related to APIs? There's different methods in API calls as well too. Uh, so one of the gentlemen I believe in the morning asked about different API methods as well. Uh, but I'm going to go over the, pretty much the four common ones. There's some other obscure ones out there. But these are pretty much like the most common ones you'll ever run across. And so the first two are probably about 85, 95, let's say 90 to be safe. Um, percentage of APIs, I just made that number up so don't quote me on it. Um, and the first one is get, so commonly you would assume get to be I'm requesting information from somewhere, right? And so you can request information and generally when you request information from another service, they're storing information in a database like system just like creator is. You have your tables and you have relationships among those tables and then you have records inside those tables as well, right? So you can get a list of all the items. So for example, if I want to go and ping my accounting service and say, give me a list of all the invoices, I can do so. Or I can pass it some unique identifier and say, get me the invoice with this invoice number. And so I can get a single record or a single item inside that third party service as well. Secondary, you can create a post. And if, when you're creating a post, you're basically sending information to this third party service and you're not really getting anything back from it. Um, in a get, it's more so I'm going to send a query or send a search or send some information over and I'm expecting basically what's called a payload to come back to me and I'm going to go and figure out what to do with this information that's been returned. On a post side, it's kind of like I'm sending information over to this third party service and I kind of just want them to say, you know, thumbs up, I got it, or thumbs down, you messed up and we're not going to accept it because of X, Y, and Z reasons. And so a post is generally used to create new things in a remote table, let's say, or a remote application. The bottom two, put and delete, not so commonly used, I guess, they're kind of coming up a little bit more. A put does more like an update or a replacement rather than having to do a post that overwrites a record. You can use a put to kind of update individual fields within a record, to put it in kind of creator terms. And a delete obviously deletes a record versus you would have to post a delete request that, you know, kind of just doesn't seem like very intuitive. So they came up with the other methods. I'm sure there's more engineering, you know, reasoning behind these kind of things, but it's the most layman's example that I understand that kind of does things. So you can make four different main types of actions um, on it. You're getting information, you're deleting information, um, updating information, and um, creating, reading, updating, deleting um, across the board for different information across different data sources. So those are your method types, and this is just a couple examples um, of a couple API methods that you have. So you can see the top three are going to be based on getting information um, from some third party service and how it's kind of stored. So you can see it's kind of similar to a folder structure. Generally, most APIs are kind of formatted this way, like you have folders on your Mac or your PC um, and data is stored inside those folders. And so here we're basically looking inside that subscribers quote folder and I'm going to put in an address or sorry, an ID, so a unique identifier for a single customer and say, get me all the addresses for this unique subscriber that I have. Um, on the next example, we have a list of an ID for an organization, and then it's going to give me all the addresses this organization has assigned to it. The third example is a little bit more, you know, lax because it's going to say just get me all the organizations in this entire table without any kind of restriction. The last three examples, one is creating a new organization with that post request in green. The next one is deleting an organization with the unique identifier or the IDs that Dylan covered in his relationship session. Um, so it's deleting a single item. And the last one is getting 
all the item details for a specific organization. So instead of getting all the addresses, it's getting just all the details about that organization in itself, not really filtering anything further down on that one. Data stored in different formats, square peg, round hole. Basically what that means is when you have two different services that are, you're trying to connect with each other, what ends up happening is nobody wants to have like a uniform way of storing information. So I'm going to take a, show you a, two quick screenshots of just a little sheet that has a couple records in it. So this one has phone or yeah, name, phone number, and birthdays for a bunch of people. Then you have this weird person who wanted to be super precise about it, and they made a spreadsheet that has first name, last name, phone number in a different format with parentheses and everything, um, but they forgot the hyphen in the middle just because they wanted to be really frustrating. And then they went and put like a super long date format out here, right? So if you compare these two different data formats, they're essentially the exact same, they're supposed to be the same pieces of information just in different formats. Uh, but here it's just two different ways that the information is being stored. And if you try to basically merge that information together, and let's say the bottom is your creator application and the top is some other app that you're fetching information from, you try to bring that top information down into creator, you're gonna have a hard time because your data, date formats aren't correctly formatted, your phone numbers aren't correctly formatted, and your names are just all clubbed together in a single field rather than being split among two columns, right? And so this happens pretty commonly across mo many services just because everyone's gonna have their own methodology for how they wanna store that information out there. So generally what ends up happening is you kinda have to do a bit of data manipulation. Um, and just to make things a little bit worse, not only are we gonna show it you know, or store information in different formats like this, we're also gonna send information in different formats like this. And so on the left is something called XML, on the left is something called XML, and on the right is something called JSON. And basically there's just kind of two industry standard ways of data is being transported. And so both of these left and right columns show the exact same information. You can just tell on the right it's a lot easier to read than the one on the left, right? On the left it has significantly more amount of characters in general. And so the XML kind of, I guess, response language, let's call it, is kind of being phased out just because it takes a lot more Basically, the size of the data being sent is a lot more because there's a lot more characters on the left-hand side versus you, can, you have a lot less characters on the right-hand side, right? And so it's the same way the information is being stored. Um, you can also look at it in kind of a folder structure like I was talking about earlier with the API calls. You have employee info at the very top, then you have a list of employees underneath, and inside each employee there's two fields called name and age, and there's two different values in it. You can see the name is in double quotes indicating it's a string value and the age is in just a number 40 because it's an integer or a number value, right? So this is how really that information, basically this information, when it goes to and from another service, it's going to get translated into this kind of a format 99.9% .9 .9 of the time. And so if you take this a bit further, this is just two apps that I was showing in two different types of data. But when you have a bunch of different apps from a bunch of different vendors, we have this whole thing that we call integration spaghetti, and you try to connect these different products, and then one product changes the way that they send information out, or another one sets up new limits, and you try connecting all these things, you're going to end up in with a lot of problems down the line that can be avoided if you had just used Zoho from the very beginning. Um, and so that's your sales pitch for the end of the day. Um, and so three main steps of this API call, then we'll just jump into the product and start doing some examples here. You're gonna get information from some third party service. You're gonna to have to manipulate that data to kind of match the format that you want in your own system. And then you're gonna actually store it or insert it inside the table or the creator application that you're doing this whole spiel in. So let's jump into a demo real quick. And so I've got one quick website I'm gonna take you to. It's called yesno.wtf. I just preface to you, sometimes the results on this page are not work appropriate. Cross my fingers on this one. So you go to the site, and basically every time, oh, whew, work appropriate. So every time you go to this page, what happens is, I'm gonna do a couple refreshes so you can see, it's gonna randomly say yes or no on the screen. There'll be some GIF that kind of explains that action as if you didn't know what the word meant already. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? It's just a random yes or no generated, right? So sometimes it's true false if you just want some random thing and you don't know how to um, get that random piece of information from somewhere, you have this thing, right? And so it's a silly, silly website, but at the very, very bottom left corner, if I zoom in, there's a question mark that says API. So I'm gonna click on that bad boy and it shows me this thing. Do you need an API, bro? That's pretty much how you communicate with the younger generation nowadays. Um, and the answer is obviously yes, you need the API. So here at the very top in that gray bar, you can see the 
uh, method that we're going to use to communicate with this service is called a get request. So it's already made that pretty clear for us. It just showed a forward slash, which is a little bit confusing. I'm not really sure why it just shows a forward slash, but we'll figure that out in a second here. And then at the bottom, this data looks pretty similar to what we expect in the JSON format I showed earlier, where we see, you know, a field on the left and a value on the right hand side. So the answer is yes. There's clearly something called forced, which I'm not really sure what it's for, but, you know, it's just false by default. And then there's a link to the image that we can access and do whatever we want with it. If I scroll down a little bit further, I can see that there's something called parameters. And so the parameters that it wants to see is the word parameter, the force parameter. And I can either be yes, no, or maybe, which is kind of forcing it to be a yes answer, forcing it to be a no answer, or forcing it to be a maybe answer. And so maybe you have like, you know, um, some system where you want to send a GIF of a yes image in some magical business scenario um, every single time you do something, you can add a string that says yes as force, and it'll make sure that every single result that's returned will no longer be random and will only be yes results. And then clearly at the end, it adds something a little bit more exciting. They return a maybe answer every 10,000 times, um, which just seems like it would mess with you. I've done this website probably a thousand times. I've never come across the maybe. So I'm really hoping one day during a presentation I see it and I can experience that. So I'm going to come in here into Creator. And I'm just going to mess with an app that I already have. And I'm going to pop into the edit application in the top right corner. And we don't mess with forms when we're doing APIs. We hop straight into settings. And we're going to go right into our bad boy custom functions. This is where we're going to be doing all of our work. Because putting things into functions, like we talked about earlier, I want to say it was Tala session, helps us organize that information and kind of silo it off into what we want to do here. So we're going to just call this function real quick, yes, no, and I'm going to create it. And I'm going to zoom in on here so everyone can see it. And add a first line. So in order to actually get the information from some third party service, I have to do a function that's called get URL. Um, I thought I had a slide on the different functions we're going to be using, but in this case, we're going to use our handy dandy drag and drop uh, system over here. And you can see that there's a section called web data on the left hand side. And there's basically how we interact with other services. And so one is the Zoho integrations, obviously, other integrations that don't even get the capital letter just because we want to show them that level of respect. And then get URL, post URLs, and open URLs. So in this case, we want to use that get, um, get request because that's what the website said we needed. So I'm going to zoom out, drag this get. And I'm going to put it right in the little box. So if I zoom in, it gives me basically this little format. So the variable here on the left hand side is going to be what is being stored um, as the response coming from that third party service. So here I'm going to just make it a simple variable I can mess with. Yes, no, underscore response. And now inside here I need to put a string. And the string is going to be the URL that I want to get information from, right? Right? Yeah, right. So I'm going to come here, and it tells me that I need to do a get on a forward slash. So sometimes you will learn that when you're messing with APIs, you have no idea how to interpret this information. Every website will use different formats, different documentation types, different levels of details, different levels of no details. And you kind of got to figure it out. Honestly, nobody taught me. And if you try to Google what is forward slash API means, you start getting weird results that don't really help you here. So then I just started messing with this, and I looked in the URL, and I saw that it said yes, no, dot WTF, and then forward slash hashtag API. So I was like, hey, that thing just says API in the website, and it has a hashtag in, in the URL. So let me just delete this and see what happens. Oh, snap, forward slash API really just meant add forward slash API to the main website's um, URL, and then I'll get this information. So now this web page does not look very cool anymore, right? There's no more picture. But I did get the same pretty much results that I was getting, just not in the pretty format. The answer is no this time. Um, the, whether it was forced or not is false. And the image URL is the GIF, right? So if I do a couple refreshes on this URL, sometimes I'll get a yes, sometimes I'll get a no. And you'll kind of just see that the URL is changing on the right-hand side, showing that it's getting refreshed every single time. So I'm going to take this little URL and copy-paste that in my creator app and put it as a string inside this function. And I'm going to press save. I feel like nobody really talked about this earlier, but in the script builder, there's a bunch of nifty little keyboard shortcuts. So you can press command S, and you will see at the bottom, it just kind of flickers in the save. And you can press command E to execute that function, and it'll go and execute it right away. So sometimes if you just don't want to have to click around in that bottom right corner, go ahead and use those keyboard shortcuts. They're super helpful. Look at that. I'm done. Let's go home.
All right. So I saved it, I executed it, nothing happened, right? How come nothing happened? One said no parameters, one guy said I didn't print it. Didn't print it is the answer. Um, so what I'm going to do is a quick little info statement, and I'm going to info the yes, no response. And now I click save, or I didn't click save. I use my keyboard shortcuts and press Command E. So now I can see this is what that variable is actually holding. And it's pretty much the same thing that was printed in the web browser, just now it's stored in, in a format inside this collection variable, essentially. And so here we can look at it. Pretty, it's a pretty basic one. We have three tags, essentially, I'll call them, or fields. One is the image field, if you will. One is the answer field, and one is the forced field, right? And each field has a value with it. The image field has a URL value, but they're all strings. The answer is a no, and the forced value is a false or true-false kind of value. So what I really want to do here is I want to get this word no out of, out of the, uh, what do you call it, response that it's giving me, right? So if I want to get one piece of information out, um, but let's use this in creator terms where it's a little bit more relatable. Let's say this yes-no response variable is based on a fetch that I did on a different table. And I want to go and get a single field value out of that collection variable that I got from a lookup field. How would I normally do that? All right, so if I wanted, <laughs> If I want to get information from another, uh, from another table in Creator, I generally do a lookup. And then once I have that lookup, I want to basically put a field name in there and then say, get me the value. Or it'll be like response variable dot field name is how we kind of get the field value that was there stored originally in that um, response that came back from the lookup. And it's not too different here. So what ends up happening is there's a function called, yes, there's a function called get JSON. So what I can do is, I can say something like, let's say, response in general. Hopefully you're using better names than I am. And I can say, we're going to dig into this yes, no response, and we're going to get a single piece of information out of there. So if you had a map, for example, which has a bunch of different key value pairs in it, this is the exact same thing, a bunch of key and the value. The image is a key, and the URL is the value. The forced is a key, and no is a value, right? And so here, normally in a regular map, you would just say dot get and then you'd put the key in there. But in this case, it's kind of a special um, map variable in the sense that it's in a different format. So we're going to do a get JSON on it instead. And here, I'm going to put answer. So I'm going to come in here, and now I'm going to add another one and info the response real quick. And I'm going to execute it. So here I can see at the very bottom, I got this no. Everyone got the no, right? So I pulled that no out of that entire response that came earlier. So just to prove that I'm not doing black magic, I'll put an image here. And now I'm going to get the image field. But luckily, everything gets saved. And so I zoom back in. And I'm going to click Execute to avoid any further embarrassment. And now I can see at the very bottom, I've got the URL alone. So now I can take that URL, I can store it in an image field in Creator, I can do whatever I want with it, or I can just say if the answer is yes, go do something, if the answer is no, go do something, and you know, I can make those kind of changes based on however I want to. So within like three, within three lines, we were able to make a script that basically gets information from some third party service, and we're able to figure out how to get our single bit of information out of there, right? All right, cool. I'm going to show you a couple more, a little bit more complicated, well, complicated is a relative term, right, guys? Um, I'm going to show you a couple different examples. One's a little bit more business-oriented, and one's a little bit more fun-oriented. So the first one is business, and it's email verification. Well, doesn't sound very cool, does it, guys? Um, and we're going to do something where if I have this little mini form, if I type in any email address, there's a couple checks that's going to happen. So a lot of times we have people enter an email address in a form, a lot of people register for services online. You type in an email address, and then you just create some dummy password because you don't want to give them your real stuff. And then that email address may or may not be a real email address, right? How do you know if it's a real email address or not? Well, basically, you send an email to it to figure out if it's a real email address. But at that point, when you send the confirmation email or whatever, it's a little bit too late. So a lot of times on what services will do is basically they'll have this checker that's implemented where if you type in an email address and click submit and try to register, it'll be like, oh, wait, that's not even a valid email address we beat you before you tried to beat us kind of situation, so we only get real emails that register for us. So I'll give you an example. My email address at Zoho is tages at zohocorp.com. So I wrote a little script that whenever on user input of this field, it'll go and 
check all these different details. So format check basically makes sure that it's a valid email format. And a valid email format basically means it has the at sign um, and then a dot something, right? Basically every email has those three key components. The next one is an SMTP check. And so that basically means that it's allowed to receive emails. I'm not really sure why they didn't get checked because last I checked I get emails. So I'll figure out what's going on there. Um, the next one is a DNS check, which basically makes sure that the website is a real website and it receives emails as well. Um, the next one is a free check, where basically it checks if it's a free service or not. So if I typed in my name at gmail.com, I don't own this, but whoever the guy that does, he's going to regret it. And so here you can see the free check actually got checked on it because it's, a free, it's provided by a free service provider. Same thing, this Yahoo guy, I don't know who he is, but also will regret it. If I pop out of there, um, let's just put one to make him feel a little bit better. It'll check. Not even a real valid, not, not even, oh man, oh, there it goes. All right, so free email and catch all is kind of weird because I figured that'd be a real person. So I'm going to figure out why they don't, or why to check. But otherwise, the email is proper and everything works for it. So just to know that these things aren't just clicking around or check boxes aren't getting checked randomly. I'm going to show you this short little script that I got going on here and break down each little step for it. It is not here, it's in workflows. And so. This is about a 15 line script, I would say. 16 technically, but minus two for these little brackets. And I'm just gonna walk through line by line what's happening, because sometimes it looks really cool, but a lot of programming and a lot of scripting in general is just looking through an example, seeing how someone else did it, and then kind of making tweaks so you can understand how to do it for your own use case. That's what most programming is, stealing other people's stuff, learning what they did, and tweaking it. Um, and so the very first line on this thing is just a base. So I'm basically just creating a, uh, uh, creating a, 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 what do you call it? a variable that's going to store this URL. So this URL, it starts out pretty normal, email verification dot who is XML um, API dot com slash API. So we're pretty familiar with this formatting of a URL um, at this point. And then a version one, it could be version two, but I guess that's just what they have. And then I got this thing called API key equals. Rule number one about API keys, don't show people your API keys. It's kind of like giving them your username and password. You have access to that person's account, and if anybody was crazy enough and really hated me, they would just copy that uh, API key down and start spamming you know, the service with a bunch of requests, and it would shut my account down, right? So things like that you really shouldn't be sharing, but if it's in a private script, it's okay. So generally, a lot of times what I'll end up doing is I'll create either a temporary table in a creator application that has my authentication keys or something. I can encrypt it at rest now with the newest feature, and I can access that information doing a lookup very easily, and I don't share that table with anybody. So this way, my stuff is you know, technically stored in creator and, and safe, but also only I have access to it, and I put the right permissions and security controls in there. But that's just me. And then at the very end, you can see I've got something that here that says, and email address equals, right? So a lot of times in URLs, you'll see that you have a base URL, like google.com or something, and then you have a bunch of, you know, and signs, and then, you know, probably a field value equaling, and then some other field value. Um, and that's basically just how, you know, the web pretty much works, is you have, even at this API level over here, you'll, you'll see question mark API key equals something. So it's just like passing a field name and a field value in the URL instead of filling it out normally. So I've got this URL up here that says, you know, zoe.creator.com or whatever, slash username, slash email verification, or slash app name. And then it says email details at the very end, which is the form name, right? So what I can really do is I can obviously dynamically do it, but here I'll just manually do it. If I put a question mark, and then I put the field name, so here it's just called email, I think. So I'll put email equals tages at zohocorp.com. And you can pre-populate information inside this application automatically. Just like you can do that in Creator, other services let you do it as well. So popping back into the script, you'll see that all I did was take an, establish a new variable called URL, and I took the base uh, value from above, and I added the input.email, or basically the email that somebody had inputted into this form at the very end of that URL string. Then I did a simple get URL request, just like I did on the yes, no example, where I plugged that URL in there, and all that response was stored in something called RESP. Again, should have used better names, but whatever. And so here I've got the next couple lines, every single one of these checkbox fields is basically getting um, a JSON value from that response and then parsing it and figuring out if it's true or false. And based on true or false, it'll update that box to be checked or not checked, right? And then at the very end, the one that got a little bit tricky 
was something called MX Records. And MX Records is some complicated thing of how your website manages emails. It's more technical than I want to get into. Um, and I just basically made it so it has um, a line break instead of commas in it. So it's a little bit of a loop. But we're just going to ignore that bottom part. And so what I can do here is I can even do an alert. And I'm going to alert the response to show you exactly what would happen when someone enters an email. Anyone know why I'm using an alert instead of an info? I don't have a console, right? So whenever you're using an application, you can't really mess with infos too much. Alert messages are how you interact with somebody using a form in the live mode. So I'm going to come back here and type in Tejas at zocorp.com, tap out, and I can see that this alert message popped up. And this, again, looks pretty similar in that same JSON format. Um, what do you call it? That all I need to do is go pluck out information in. Is the format check true? So I plucked out get JSON format check, and it'll give me the value true, and it checks that box. I can pluck out SMTP and all these other things, and it'll mark the box as either true or false and in the live application. So that's what those lines do. And then you can see here we got this little weird little thing where these MX records are that I had to go and mess with to make it look a little bit prettier. 15 lines, technically 10 if we don't count this bottom nonsense of code, will basically go and check an email for me every single time it's entered, make sure it's valid, and if it's not valid, I could throw an error message saying, hey, Nice try, buddy, but you got to use a real email here. All right, I got one really last example because they're going to kick me off stage. And this one just looks a little cooler and prettier, so I'll show it to you and then break it down. So this one's a little bit niftier. This one uses, uh, I can look up basically a movie or a TV show. So South Park is not there. I heard in the front. South Park. Click Submit. Takes me down here. Oh, it's right there. Yeah, yeah. So I got South Park here. And basically, I got some information about it, the TV, sh the category that it's in, the name of the TV show. I got information about, you know, an overview, a very tame overview of the show, really. Um, uh, an average score that it's coming from, and then a unique ID that's coming from this third-party service. And I also pulled in two pictures, um, a poster image and a background picture that I can use for whatever. And so I can use this ID to go and get more information later down the line based on that unique identifier. Right now, all I'm doing is a search based on the text, but I can use that unique identifier and then go and get more information like the characters in the show, the producers, the channel that it's on, and all that kind of complicated stuff. Had I cared to impress you guys a little bit more than I already did, I would have done that stuff, but I feel like I already accomplished my goal. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of the script so you understand how it works. And so you can see this is not a complicated application at all. There's only three forms, the search form, um, where I'm storing the searches, and the actual entities like phone, or sorry, like movie and TV show, and three little workflows that are happening here. One is redirecting people after I click submit. The other one is populating the search form, and that top one doesn't really matter. So I'm going to come in here and look at this deluge script, and you can see here this one's about 30 lines, so it's a little bit more crazy, but not too much more. A lot of it is going to be repetitive. And so the very first step is a lookup that basically stores the category. So like I talked about earlier, um, you know, I did a fetch and figured out what the actual method, whether it's a TV show or a movie, I want to look up. And then it has a unique category label in the back end. So I kind of fetch it that way. If you don't know what I said, then that's cool. It doesn't really matter. Just pretend it says TV shows or movies. Simple. The next thing, I made a smarter move. I didn't show you guys my API key because then that would really kill me. And so I, you can see I've created a little function here that will go and fetch um, the, t the movie database um, function out of the authentication workspace and get me the API key and store it there. So here, the API key is never exposed to anybody who can see the script. Then I've got the very simple URL that they have, api.moviedb.com or .org. Um, three probably means version three. Search is going to be the method that I'm using, you know, slash search, just like we had slash um, API and different methods and the different things I showed earlier. Then I throw in that category. What category am I searching? TV shows, people, movies, um, studios, producers, etc. They have a bunch of different categories. And then I plug in that API key at the very end. What I have to do here is a little bit tricky, though. So this I should cover because it's important. When you have a category or a search request, a search request has a space in it, right? Um, a search request can have a space in it. So South Park has a space, obviously, right? And if you've ever used the internet, you understand that you can't really put a space in a website, right, and a URL because it doesn't work. So what we have to do is we basically have to turn that space into what's called an encoding, where it'll change the space into a percent twenty, which. If you're ever bored and look at URLs that you go to, you might see them in the URLs. Um, I don't know what else to tell you on that one. Um, and it basically just 
encodes different characters that aren't allowed in a normal URL because that's how these two services are communicating each with each other is based on URLs. So I encode that, I, I skip out the spaces and apostrophes and other weird things that could cause issues, and then I go and send off or make my final URL, the API URL here, and then I'm going and doing my same thing, get URL, very basic, just putting that, uh, what do you call, plug in, getting the full response. And then what happens here is a little bit tricky. So in the last two examples, um, it was just a simple response coming back, a single item, whether it was the yes, no, or whether it was the email being sent. Here, when I'm doing a search on South Park, there could be 100 different results on South Park, right? There could be variants. So the office was very tricky because there's a US office and a UK office, and it doesn't know which one I'm really w looking for unless I specify it clearly. So because I'm lazy, I just basically said, give me a list of all the results. And so I get the JSON of that results folder. And then I say, make it a list and just get me the very first result. I trust your search method. You're going to return the one that I probably meant anyway. And so just get me the first result. So that's why first result equals dot get zero because I'm getting the very first item in that list. And then running through this a little bit quicker here, I'm going to get the overview. And then I get the two pictures. And so what I have to do here is a little bit tricky too because what they respond with is a poster path, which is basically a relative URL to, that they have. And so I had to go and do some digging and figuring out where that image is actually stored. And then this way that image can be saved there. Um, helpful tip that kind of might frustrate a lot of people. If you have an image field and you want to add a remote image to be stored in this image field, you have to use these HTML tags. If you just try to put a URL directly to an image, not going to work for you, the more you know. Um, and then the very end, I basically just have a little flicker that goes between names and titles because a TV show has a name and a movie has a title because they want to make it pretty complicated that way. And it'll go and insert all that information into the actual searches form. So 30 lines of code with a lot of generous spacing in there. And I've basically fetched all the details of information from the movie database, brought it into my creator application. Um, so I can wow you guys, really, that there was only one reason to build this yesterday. So thank you guys for coming. Thanks for listening to the session. And I'm done.